Okay, let's get started. Um, we are pleased to be hosting Re Suresh, sorry, <laughs> Suresh Daniela from Clarkson University. Um, he is the Bayard D. Clarkson Distinguished Professor of Mechanical and Aeronautical Engineering at Clarkson University and the co-director of the Center for Air Resources Engineering and Sciences. Um, his interests, research interests include development and, of novel aerosol sensing techniques, optoelectrical aerosol measurements, aerosol resuspension, atmospheric aerosol sampling and analysis, and computational fluid dynamic simulations. Um, he's a recipient of a, of a number of awards, including Clarkson's John W. Graham Jr. Award, NSF's Career Grant, and uh, a Fulbright Nehru Scholar. Uh, he did his PhD at the University of Minnesota with the Paul, uh, Particle Technology Laboratory, and then he did a postdoc at Caltech with Paul Winberg. So I will let him take over from here. Thank you, John. <clears throat> right, I'm trying to see if we can use this laser pointer. All right, so uh, this talk is going to be about uh, some of our efforts to develop. Uh, is relatively low cost sensor that we can try and put towards uh, large scale measurements. It's just a quick rundown on some of the stuff I do here. I, because uh, this talk is going to be uh, a bit of an engineering focused talk, and uh, and I'm I'm coming to a scientific uh, institution. I figure I'll give you a little bit of uh, uh, a flavor of some of the other things I do. That's also some more engineering focused, but less sensor development, more. Uh, uh, closer to what we do at, at NCAR, for example. So uh, we build uh, uh, aircraft inlets, and we've worked uh, quite a bit with NCAR uh, and NASA on this, and we have an ongoing project with Frank uh, in, uh, in further development of these inlets. Um, and we've flown uh, with, with folks here and at NASA on the uh, C-130 uh, and DC-8 aircrafts. Uh, we do actually a lot of uh, flow modeling, so uh, a lot of these inlet developments are uh, using computational fluid dynamics, I'll skip that. <coughs> um, so in, in the Center for Air Resources Engineering um, and Sciences, we have a, a, a couple big wind tunnels with cross sections uh, of three feet, three foot by five, four foot. And uh, these ones, the one I've shown here, this is when it was brand new. It's populated with a lot more stuff right now. At the front end is... Uh, uh, there's a full bank of HEPA filters, so the air coming into the tunnel is all cleaned, and then we can inject particles we want and test inlets for ambient m monitoring, for example. Then we've got a faster one, same cross-section, that where we, we are going to try and do some of the testing that's aircraft-based also. Um, instrument development, we do quite a bit. Uh, we have a... We have some uh, fast scanning, differential mobility analyzer work we have, we have built here, and we've flown with NCAR, so a lot of NCAR connections. Um, uh, we've just finished the development of a hygroscopic tandem DMA, which we've also flown as part of our Aristro campaign, and we'll be trying to get back onto one of these campaigns to test and measure distributions of growth factors. Going through quickly so we can get to the main talk here. Uh, but uh, some of the other work we're trying to do right now is in understanding how particles interact with surfaces and what it would take to remove them. So it's quite different from aerosol um, science where we're interested in particles in air. We're interested in now particles in surfaces. And uh, a lot of the work has been in trying to use complex um, models on, of uh, particle interaction on... Uh, on substrates, uh, looking at a lot of all of the literature data that's available. So we didn't collect all of this data. We just looked at the literature, collected all of the data, and put it together, and tried and, and see. Uh, and we've we've been able to show that our theoretical work can predict the behavior of you know a lot of the data sets that are out there in terms of particles trapped on surfaces. What would it take to remove it? We can theoretically capture it. So so that's. Uh, and that's uh, another project that we're going, uh, that we've been building, that we've been working on. Um, particle removal happens in a very small wind tunnel, and so we've got, we've designed, this is pretty dark right here, a, a wind tunnel that's just about this big, where we can get very high wind speeds, about 100, 150 meters per second going through a three millimeter channel. That's what's required to remove small particles like bacteria, and so this study was geared towards that. Um, okay. 
one of the projects that's ongoing is to just uh, use uh, photographs and try and measure air quality from uh, from that. And so this is towards our effort to to try and get air quality at high resolution, which uh, I'll skip some of the details here, but what we've been basically analyzing pictures such as this, you can get commercially from an EarthCam website. We can see what the changes in the in the qualities of the pictures and, and try and extract turbidity information from it, which is then related to air quality. Uh, and, and so we've been able to actually uh, show that we can calculate turbidity uh, and have it be correlated to PM 2.5 at the levels of about 10 to 30 microgram per meter cube, so pretty low concentrations. All right, but the main talk uh, I want to uh, talk about here is uh, some of our work that's ongoing. <coughs> um, so this is ongoing work on sensor development, and our idea here is, you know, can we build something uh, that's focused not primarily on being more sensitive or more accurate or more... Uh, um, uh, resolution-wise, um, you know, have a higher resolution, but be focused on giving us measurements that's appropriate from a, a air quality monitoring perspective, while at the same point, at the same time, being something that can be deployed in large scale. So, meaning, could be relatively compact in size, would be relatively low cost, and we'll get to low cost, which is a somewhat undefined term, very shortly. Um, just very quick uh, um, <clears throat> introduction about what we are interested in. Um, so we're interested in PM 2.5. If I measured, if I just counted the number of particles and I plotted them as a function of size, so how many particles would be in different sizes, that would be the solid line here. Uh, but for, for most of uh, uh, health-based studies are all based on uh, PM, on, on based on mass of particles, so that would be if we weighed all of the particles in the different size bins and plotted, that would be my dashed line. And, and particles below 2.5 micron are considered to have the combination of both the, the, there's a high probability that we'll actually deposit them in the respiratory system. And there's a good probability that these would be actually formed from processes that result in their compositions being uh, harmful to health. So these are more, both dangerous for health and and these are ones that we can actually deposit. So that's uh, the area of the curve is sort of the parameter that we'd be, we'd be most interested in in this talk. I just took a snapshot of what you can get from this AQIC and this thing. It is by no means a, a, an exhaustive uh, uh, website in, in sort of collecting what PM 2.5 uh, data is available globally, but it provides you a snapshot of, you know, where uh, do we measure air quality right now? There's a, there's a lot of monitoring happening in the U.S., much more than those, uh, those, uh, those uh, points out there show, and in Europe and so on. But there's a real dearth of, uh, of monitoring in, uh, in Africa. Parts of India, if you see, are, are not well covered. Western part of China is also under uh, monitored. <laughs> of course, there's, there's other parts of Central Asia that's, that's also uh, not well covered for air quality uh, in terms of uh, PM measurements. <coughs> And like I said, uh, uh, PM 2.5 has been shown to be directly uh, related to, air uh, to uh, human health. And so these measurements are uh, in the U.S. regulated by EPA, and, and similarly globally, um, the, the environmental agencies require these measurements. But because of the expense of putting these sites together and the cost of, uh, and, the, uh, and, the, and the manpower required, uh, the expansion is not as simple as, uh, you know, uh, we might desire from a measurement perspective. Uh, one of the things is, of course, these sensors are big. You need big housing. It needs to be appropriately located. Uh, and then handling it. And so what, what many of the agencies are finding is that trying to, trying to get data from it, meaning handling those filters correctly, making the right measurements, is all pretty expensive. And that labor cost is, is challenging. So there's a <clears throat> bit of a push towards uh, low-cost sensors. and, and and, and these sensors are, are geared towards measuring PM 2.5, because that's a parameter uh, that has been most uh, attributed to, uh, to health. Um, and, uh, and, and you want, ideally you want it to be sort of, uh, you know, ideally you want this to be 
sensitive to particles over all sorts of size ranges and compositions down to vehicle exhaust. I use vehicle exhaust because if you look at your uh, uh, spark ignition vehicles, the particles coming out of there are numerous in number, down to about 10, 20 nanometers. We've ha we have to at least hit those particles. Um, and so, so what are the techniques that are available? So I'll just go through my, in the, in the next about 10 minutes or so, I'll talk about what exists for techniques and, uh, and what the pitfalls are before I go to what we are proposing as our approach. Um, <clears throat> so if you have a particle source, and this particle source sends a, a pretty narrow stream of particles, so a single stream of particles, you can shoot light across it, collect light in a detector, and what you would get is a signature such as this. And on x-axis, I have a, a size parameter, which is basically the particle size divided by the wavelength. Or for a given wavelength, I just put size on the top. So we'll just, we can use the top particle size. Goes from, uh, goes from uh, 10 nanometers to about 10 micron. Uh, 10 nanometers to 10 micron, that's my size range. And that's sort of the size range. We're interested in air quality, a little less, 2.5, let's say. So what you can do is you can figure out, depending upon how much light is scattered out, you can, you can figure out what size it is. So you can measure how much light is scattered. We can figure out what size it is. And that would give us, for each single particle that scatters light, you would know uh, what the size is. And then you can bin it together and get a whole size distribution. All right, so I'm going to try and plot this. I'm going to keep this as a running theme here. I'm going to plot particle diameter in the x-axis going from 10 nanometers to 10 micron. My interest is somewhere in the 2.5 and smaller. The y-axis, I'll plot my estimate of cost. All right, this is sort of what it might cost me to, if I go to a manufacturer to go buy this. So this is a plot that we don't usually see. We, uh, as scientists, we usually ignore the whole cost plot, but that's when I have a low cost in my title, I'm going to try and see if I can maintain that. And it's in a log scale, all right? It's in a log scale, so this is, uh, so keep track of that. Uh, I just, and I'm putting one of these instruments here. I hope the other manufacturers aren't going to be angry about it, but I just took one that's closest to your guy, you guys here. So I took uh, DMT's UHSAS. Um, the, the dashed line here represents the fact that we can actually get sizing information from it. Uh, so you can get sizing information somewhere in the one micron to 55, 60, 70 nanometers. That's the lower end size limit, all right? So you can do this. It's pretty expensive, though. It's about $60,000. So if you want to put this at, uh, I don't know what it is right now. It's approximately that much. But if you, if you want to, if you want to uh, uh, deploy these uh, in, in a, in a, in a large-scale network, and I'm thinking large-scale networks would be, you know, 1,000 in a city, for example. Uh, you know, that's not really scalable. All right. <clears throat> Let's make things a little less expensive. So one of the things that was making the, um, that, that makes uh, the UHSAS uh, expensive, one of the many things, is that you know, you're trying to get a single stream of particles and you want to focus, get light to perfectly hit it. There's a little bit of uh, uh, delicate placement of, uh, of, um, of uh, your optics and, 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 and you want, you're trying to detect single particle at a time, which means you want some pretty good uh, PMT at the uh, photomultiplier tubes at the back end, all of that adds to expense here. We can, we can make it immediately less expensive by not focusing on a single particle, but just shooting light and getting uh, you know, particles to, a cloud of particles to scatter. All right, this cloud of particles would scatter and you detect the signal right here. So it's the same idea as before, everything's identical. <coughs> the difference is uh, in the equation down here, you can see what the signal, uh, what the signal would be is that the signal would be some integral of the number of particles here, or the concentrations of particles here, of different sizes. And depending upon, and each of these sizes are uh, scattering light as a function of uh, angle. So that's all captured here. So light is coming out at, at different angles for particles in different sizes, and there's n different uh, numbers of each of these particles uh, in each size bin. When you put them all together, you'll get a net signal. Um, if the scattering signal is proportional to diameter cubed, all right? If, it's, if this, this integral, the net light here is proportional to diameter cubed, then your signal would actually work out to be proportional to mass, all right? ignoring density for right now. So we could actually get a signal that's proportional to mass. That's a great health-related quantity. 
All right, so I just I just taken uh, some range of angles. If I put in a detector that's spanning from 60 to 120 degrees, um, and I'm assuming water for composition, and I'm I'm looking at uh, you know what the scattering signature would be. This is all now integrated in those angles, and I'm I'm focusing on particles in the size range of uh, um, I want to say 300 nanometers to 2.5 micron. I, I take that because below that, the intensities drop quite dramatically, which means your photomultiplier tube isn't picking up light and converting it to a measurable current very effectively here. So most of the optical sensors, low-cost ones, aren't really picking up anything below 300 nanometers, often nothing below 500 nanometers. So a lot of particles exist between 500 nanometers to, let's say, one micron. If you look at these two slopes, Either, either in the bigger range or the smaller range, it's somewhere in 2.3 to 4. Not quite 3. If the slope were 3, the signal, the net signal would be proportional to mass. So you could take those numbers and run with it. That would be your essentially your PM number. It would be great. We are pretty close, but we didn't quite hit it. Um, more importantly, if I change, if I, the neat thing is I can change the, the collection location. I, if I'm a design engineer, I might move it around. I might get a different slope, 2.4 to 3.1. And I, I, uh, the 3.1 is, you know, in the smaller range, 2.4 here. So two things. One is once you design, of course, that's fixed. But within that, if your particles are, numer are in some size range, they may be proportional to the third power in diameter, but, but in some other regions, they may be proportional to second power. So that's, that's the reality. If I change the composition, the slope changes. All right? One other thing to note... <coughs> So I, in here, I'm plotting two curves here. The blue is my mass distribution. So I'm assuming uh, water in this case, let's say water. Um, and then I'm, I'm then also predicting the uh, scattering distribution. What is it, you know, as a, as a function of particle size, what would be the scattering distribution? So the mass distribution is this blue line, but what the, what the, um, the detectors measuring a cloud of particles would measure is the integral of the red line, all right? So what you're interested in is the integral of blue. What you're going to get is the integral of the red line. Small particles are not detected because they're just, they don't scatter enough light, and big ones are, you know, overscattering. If I change from water to ammonium sulfate, same mean size and so on, you get a slightly different relation between the two. I go to carbon, I get a completely different relation. All right, the point I'm trying to make here is you cannot calibrate it. All right, you cannot, you cannot just use a single calibration and say, let me get those areas to match so I can then work with it. You change compositions, the signatures changes completely, and, and, and that's a problem. It's known, but we're just trying to put it down here. Same thing, you take water. This just goes back to the old plot. If I change the sizes, the relative... Uh, orientations change. If I have larger, if I have same, just single composition, if it just moves in the size bin, the relative shapes of those two, red and blue curve, will change. So you, even for a single composition, if you say, I'm dealing with a single aerosol, I just want to calibrate it with that, it won't work if its sizes are changing. All right? So, so there is no way to just calibrate your way. You cannot just calibrate your way out of this problem. All right? You cannot calibrate your way out of this problem. All right, that's a problem, but what is the possibility here, all right? The why, why, is this still, why is this still of interest? It's still of interest because you can build these sensors for amazingly low cost, all right? I'm going to keep hitting this number low cost here quite a bit. So this is a, a standard thing that's very popular out in the market right now. Shinye, Sam Young, Sharp, I think something about SH you need to have, or S you need. These companies that start this are all building these, these really neat uh, Modules. Oops, wrong way. All right. So what what this is is just a small resistor that gets heated up, that pushes flow, and uh, and uh, that, you know that'll. So you'll have air coming in, going out in its own random direction. You shoot light, and then you collect light, and then you get a signature that I've been talking about. All right. So this signature, of course, would depend upon size and composition and all of that. Calibration not possible. Having said that, you can go to the market right now, find these in different packages. That's a simple module, you, but you can put that, you can package it, and you can get all these sorts of numbers. You can get this in about, I don't know, 20, 30 different model flavors if you want. All right? it's, it's, it's impressively, widespreadly available there. Uh, this is an old data set from uh, EPA. There's probably newer ones, but, but here's the, those four 
those four detectors, if you see, how do they compare against EPA's PM 2.5 measurements with, you know, the FRM uh, measurement here? So, they, so the general picture is not always very good, sometimes okay, sometimes uh, not so much, and sometimes pretty bad, and, and other times differently. All right, so th this is again, you know, they just take the sensors, they, they have a standard platform, they put this in so that uh, it, it's shielded from sun and light and so on, uh, so, uh, sorry, um, sun and uh, rain and so on. And then you expose it to ambient PM, and then you see how things line up. And so the, 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 the picture to uh, uh, look at is this, you know, sometimes they work great, um, sometimes not so much, but but uh, we don't have a firm story about it. But what we know is this: this is chenier costs a bit in chenier, Samyang, and so on. They cost anywhere from one to twenty-five dollars. All right. So remember, this not sixty thousand dollars, which was this, which was our UHSAS. It's it's this, this the unit itself is only about twenty-five dollars max, let's say. Uh, but I put this in a solid line because all you get is a single number. You get an integrated number. You get an integrated number. You don't quite get sizing, but you get an integrated mass or integrated scattering signature. Um, the lower size limit, all right, there is no, there is, for these optical instruments that are doing a cloud of particles, there is no lower size limit, all right? There's no lower size limit because if you put enough of small particles, you will get a scattering signature that might be visible, but you will never have anything sufficiently numerous in number to get particles below about 400, 500 nanometers with these detectors. So these detectors are not going to see anything below 500 nanometers under typical circumstances. But if you, I don't know, if you extinguish a matchstick and put it there, it might briefly show you something because this is a lot of small particles. Upper size limit is undefined uh, because we don't know what gets through those uh, pores and so on, but it's claimed to be about four or five micron and so on. You put the, you package it. You get this this low cost sensors. I use, you know, in, I'm calling this low cost spectrometers. They have a typical cut size that depends upon their inlets. That are, again is nebulous, not quite PM 2.5. The lower cut size again 400, 700 nanometers, undefined. But that's what that's what you're uh, you're at. A much higher cost version of this would be a dust rag, about ten thousand dollars. You can do. Again, solid line means you just get a total area under the red curve, the scattering signatures. And these sensors are all, uh, dust track has been ubiquitous in, uh, in, in indoor measurements and often reported as PM, of course. Uh, low cost sensors are now becoming widespread. Actually, I mean, it's in the, our community, we are not quite used to it, but it's just recently in China, and you'll see that you know, this is all being used everywhere. I'll actually show you a picture of how widespread it is. Um, particles from air, diesel particles, wood combustion, all of these, you would either capture some fraction of it or you may not even see this at all in these sensors. All right, so why should we be either uh, excited about it or worried about it? All right, so this is, this, this is getting to a large-scale deployment perspective here. Uh, in Chicago, uh, array of things. I don't know if you've heard about it. It's, uh, it's becoming a big, big deal uh, with Argon National Lab. They're going to be mapping a lot of parameters here. Not quite particles yet, but it's only, I think, a small step away. They're doing uh, other criteria, gas pollutants. And if you're worried about privacy, they are doing video and audio and so on, but in ways that apparently will, will uh, smudge those signals so they, they won't be able to exactly e eavesdrop on your conversation. Um, and the idea here is to, is, to, is to just start collecting data and start understanding how different parameters affect each other. You might know how much traffic is going on, how, the, how that affects NOx levels and so on. And they're being developed, you know, very small canisters um, that are putting, being put on lampposts. Um, in Beijing, um, right now, this is an experiment, well, this is something they've been doing for the last uh, three years, I think, from 2014, uh, in collaboration with IBM. They have 1,500 sensors in just the city of Beijing, looking at all sorts of, uh, you know, parameters. But one of those would, is, uh, is air quality, and air quality is measured with an optical sensor, and both in, in, in this one. Um, it's, it's an optical particle sensor. And there are other such experiments where it's mostly these low-cost optical sensors. <clears throat> All right, so that's the possibility. That's, that's amazing what can happen. But why should we be worried about it? So I'm just putting a plot of 
mass concentrations. These are mass concentrations measured near cook stoves. I, this was during one of my past sabbaticals when I went to India. So looking at it. So this is what um, green curve. I don't know the, the 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 colors are all messed up here. All right. This dust track is green uh, and blue is uh, PM.3, just the mass of particles less than 300 nanometers, all right, very, very small particles. If you talk to air quality people, they'll say particles below 500 nanometers, there's no mass in that, all right, no mass in that. But you look at, look at what we have, the mass of particles below 300 nanometers can sometimes be double the mass of particles greater than 300 nanometers. Remember, dust track barely sees anything below 300 nanometers. So small particles can sometimes be more numerous in mass than big particles. Agreed, this is a somewhat unique situation. We were right where, uh, you know, this cook was breathing in, in, from near a, a cook stove here. Tells me I should take my daughter for skating, but it's not right. All right. Um, so, uh, so the, uh, um, so the, the, so it depends. So, so we should not presuppose. We should not be presupposing that 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 these particles don't exist. All right, and and. And, and the concern is with low-cost sensors, we are, we are, we are going to generate all this data set that, that basically is going to tell us that, you know, air quality is maybe improving. It may be, but it may not be improving in all size uh, regimes. And the problem is particles below about 300 nanometers or below 100 ultrafine particles uh, are, are, are known to be maybe different in, in, in sort of the health effects it creates. Um, you know, I've been working more with the biology people. So b below 500 nanometers, you know, these particles become intracellular. They go into the cells. Above, you know, 500, 600, 700 nanometers, they stay outside the cell. So this difference that starts kicking in above 500 nanometers, right where the optical uh, particles uh, counters uh, sort of get cut off. Um, and there have been a number of studies. I don't need to go through each of them, but that say that, you know, ultrafine, firstly, the concentration of ultrafines in PM2.5, not perfectly correlated. So PM2.5 can go down, ultrafines can go up. And, and there have been studies, of both in population-based uh, studies, that say that ultrafines create elicit different responses. Uh, and Tony Wexler's group in Davis, they've been showing that, you know, they collect particles from different sources with different size ranges. And when they put these to mice, they have different uh, health impacts. So, so ultrafine particles have been shown to have a greater health impact for the same microgram, for the same unit uh, mass of particles injected to a, to a mouse. All right, so where does that get us? Um, so our focus is to try and use a technique that would uh, not uh, eliminate the contribution of these ultrafine particles. You know, can we actually make... You do a low cost measurement and get to a broad size range uh, s sensitivity here. So you know, we want to use electrical mobility. Uh, pardon me if this is uh, basic um, physics here, but if I put a charged particle in an electric field, it's going to be driven towards an oppositely charged electrode. Drag would pull it back, and the speed at which it travels is its electrical mobility. So, so e electrical mobility is sort of related to how fast it goes. And electrical mobility is related only to the size, and you know, and and there's a little bit of there's a charge dependence and size. So if you have if you have one charge on a particle, uh, smaller particles will travel faster. That's it. So if you measure the velocity of the particle, we can measure the size of the particle. And uh, this is not a new measurement. All right, it's conventionally uh, sorry. The uh, oh yeah, just the, just a quick note. Electrical mobility measurements when we go below about half a micron, actually, the velocities get to be significant. Um, and this is, you know, just ignore all the numbers. It just basically gets very significant. You can, uh, particles move very fast in electric field if they're below about half a micron. All right, um, this is a popular uh, uh, route for making aerosol measurements. So you can use a DMA, um, and, and you can actually get, uh, uh, you know, so if I, if I, uh, I don't know if any of these videos work. <laughs> um, I guess I could switch here, but you know, I don't know how to get out of. Uh, maybe 
No, I'm stuck with the laser here. All right. Um, if so in a differential mobility analyzer, which is a you know a really popular instrument for measuring size distribution of particles below 500 nanometers, you can inject particles here. By electrical mobility, by electric field, we can drive them out here. And depending on what electric field we apply, we can get particles of different sizes. Um, so that's a common instrument that's available. We can tap into already, get down to 10 nanometers. There's other, other techniques where we don't need to sample flow. We can just collect particles onto electrodes and get real-time signatures. Both of these techniques are available. But they're, they slot right up here in my cost to uh, size range plot, all right? So this goes back to... So now this is getting out of my $100,000 regime also here. So none of these are going to be deployed in this broad size range, in the, in the large scale, for large scale deployment. Uh, but what they, what, what they give is, of course, they give all this extra information. They give you very high size resolution, hence the finer line. Um, and, uh, and, and you can get to a, you know, the, you can almost get to a micron with that. It's pretty, pretty neat. We're going to take some of these techniques that have been developed and see if we can actually um, get to a lower cost instrument here. So what we're trying to do is, is take this, uh, so we have particles of all different sizes that we, if we can sample in and pre-charge it. I won't talk about the charger much here. I'll refer to it in the end. But if we, if, this, if we can get charged particles into the instrument and we can pass it through a, a, a region that we're calling an ESP section, electrostatic precipitator section, um, where rather than a filter, we can just use electric field to remove all charged particles. Uh, and, and we can use a, a potential difference between this red and the blue would be, you know, one would be a higher voltage than the other. The potential difference eliminates charged particles. But in a region where the potential difference is zero, we can bring charged particles to fly through. And then if I apply an electric field right here, I can classify these particles. So I can actually collect them and then connect them to an electrometer, and I can then get a signal that's basically telling me how many particles will exist relative to that size that's getting collected right here. But smaller particles get collected nearby, far, uh, bigger ones farther. And so these ones, if you build bigger and bigger, you can collect bigger and bigger particles. Um, but then the, it, it, what, what if I plotted, in addition to cost, if I plotted size, the one thing you'll also see is that when you get to low cost instruments, they also get smaller. And people also want smaller instruments because of you know, a variety of uh, advantages in deploying it. So we want to keep the small. The way to keep it small but still get big sizes is we can shift where the particles are injected. So we can inject from up, down, whatever, by changing the injection location. Um, uh, and and the final, the, the electrometer signal that you get here will depend upon how many particles, how numerous are these particles in a given size range. Uh, what fraction of those particles are charged? We'll only be detecting charged particles. And then also, you know, in, in any given channel, you're not just collecting particles in one size. You might get a collection of a range of sizes that we're calling transfer function. And all of that combined will give us an, a, a current signal that we have to measure. Um, just a quick, uh, I'll try and skip through a lot of the calculation itself. But we can calculate what particles are collected. So you, you won't collect just one particle size. You might collect pretty big particles that are moving slowly. You might collect if they start from this end and end up here. Uh, small particles that collect here but can fly through, can, can move more quickly, may be collected here. So you get, you get a range of particle sizes or mobilities. And you can also get some mean mobilities. You can calculate all that and figure out what the transfer functions look like. I'll just put the final results in here. <clears throat> what this is showing is electrical mobility. So think of that as inverse of size. The big ones here are small particles. Um, so they, they travel very fast. The so small particles, I might collect them with a poor resolution in one of the plates, but I collect them with high efficiency. When I get to big particles, my efficiency of collection might be poorer because they're just spread out over multiple plates. Uh, and in each plate, I might only collect 20, 30, 40%. But I can collect almost all of them. So, all right, I'll skip that. Um, <clears throat> all right, so, okay, I'll, I'll skip the question here. Tell, okay, so what we did is the first version we built, <clears throat> we used conventional machining where we, we used conventional machining where we, uh, um, you know, used the machine shop to, to generate our ESP section, put in fine blades through it. Um, we, we placed all the, all the collection plates very delicately. 
Um, we have a triax connector uh, to measure these currents because we are ex we were expecting, and when we, the currents we got were all in femtoamp, so we knew we were dealing with basically currents in the order of about 10 femtoamp. <clears throat> so we've got to be very careful about how we make these measurements. And then so finally, we make size distribution measurements. We had six channels, and we compared it with SMPS. You know, it all works out pretty good. Um, so, but but what what this was is this was a lot of work for us to do it. The the measurements required us to very delicately place it and so on. And if we have to do a large scale uh, uh, deployment, you know, means can we can we do this? I don't know, hundreds. Uh, let's just say even building hundred of these units would be would be would be extremely challenging. And you know, so in the end, it's, you know, the electrometer we used was a Keithley electrometer or a source meter, we used a couple different ones. They cost about seven to $8,000 themselves, uh, and there are other components in there. It all pushes up to you know, maybe $20,000. Lower cost, but not quite, and the size was also somewhat limited in, in the first version we tested. <clears throat> so the things we needed to improve is, you know, can we, can we get rid of the Keithley electrometer? It's a super good, fantastic uh, piece of uh, uh, instrument, but, uh, but not, not conducive for for low cost measurement. So, so can we build our own? Uh, and, and so a lot of the uh, electrometer development in an, from an aerosol measurements uh, has been with a, within a Faraday cup collector uh, perspective where we just want, we, you, you want you know, aerosol to pass through and then you measure it by touching the outside metal casing and then you can measure down to 0.1 femtoamp not even, without too much difficulty. So we want to get, we, that won't work for us, I'll show you why. And then fabric, <coughs> um, uh, this placement of collection plates and so on problematic. We want to get rid of that too. All right. So, so what we want to do, and maybe I'll skip the talk here and just get to the point. Um, so the, the 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 so we, so we know so we got rid of all the machine sh dealing with the uh, machine shop folks to just uh, you know 3D printing it. That was the easy part. Um, for collection, so what we did is moved out of collecting into individual carefully placed plates to we started exploring the whole uh, PCB options. So you know we use FR4 material, which is not the best of materials for uh, for uh, for low current measurement, but we said let's give it a shot. And on the back side, so that's a collection. <coughs> And and now rather than rather than get to uh, triax connectors that very carefully connect to it, we just put the electrometer right behind it. So we got a sim a single uh, uh, plate with collectors on one side and the electrometers printed on one side. So all of this is now done in a single plate. And so there's a lot of circuitry details I'll skip. And 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 so so now the question is how well does it work? So now you're t you're, you're trying to measure femtoamps right across. 10,000 volts, uh, all right? So, so any small fluctuations in it will all be recorded. So how well can we do? So we put particles through it, <coughs> um, uh, and then we can, okay, let me skip through all these ones. I'll get to what we get for results. All right, so what, what we get for results is so we can send particles of different sizes continuously. So we're varying particles of different sizes. The blue line is different sizes. And what we can find is that, you know, as uh, you know, as we were expecting, we were able to get signals. This is all pretty high signals, 10 to 30 femtoamp, which is, which is good. So we don't quite, we can't quite, we've got a lot of noise in the sub 4, 5 femtoamp, but we can get, uh, you know, out, to, out in the 30 femtoamp. We change the voltage on the top, we can collect smaller particles or bigger particles. This is the first test to see, you know, can we actually print these electrometers and can we get a signal responsive to it? Um, okay, that's that's just saying you know things work, but but can we actually model it and say exactly what sizes are being captured? So in here we are changing particle size continuously in upstream DMA, and we are expecting particles of of a particular set of sizes to be captured with these efficiencies. That was the theory line, and what we're seeing is that the signal did sort of go up and down as expected. All right, so this was the first test to suggest that a new electrometer actually does. Uh, um, and the new, the whole printed design does work, and so on. All right, so so we know the the rest of the things work, and when you can print it, what that does is it still brings it down to about only about three to five thousand dollars, because each of those electrometers, it turns out the single biggest, there's two big costs here. High voltage is about five hundred dollars, small cheap one, and and the resistors for um, for uh, these measurements, one terawatt resistors cost over thirty to fifty dollars. You put ten channels right there. We're talking about another five hundred dollars right there. So you know it's not easy to cut costs with, with electrical mobility measurements. 
So as a final thing, what we want to do is people are not interested in size distribution measurements from a health perspective. They want one single number, PM. All right, so can we just get to it so we don't need all the seven, ten channels or whatever we want. So what we want is collect all particles, get them onto a single plate, and get a signal from it that's, that's uh, you know, maybe uh, directly proportional to mass. The signal is a complicated relationship that depends upon how much these particles are charged, what fractions are collected, and all that. And if you collect it on a... On a rectangular plate, you'll get a signal that doesn't directly tell you what it is. You, if the particles are charged more, you'll get a bigger signal and then, then, the, then corresponding to these particles. So what we, what we are proposing, what we want to do is shape the plate where we collect particles of different sizes with different efficiencies. So, you, you, so the particles that are maybe charged more efficiently, you may want to collect them less efficiently to negate the particles that are charged less efficiently. So you can then get... Uh, your, your, your net signal gets a little more complicated, the math gets a little more complicated, and you get a transfer function. The, the collection efficiency becomes uh, size dependent and shape dependent. All right, again, I'm skipping all the math because the math is boring. Um, all right, but, but the point I want to make is this. The, the, the shape dependent collection, uh, if, I, if I shape the plate, I can make it be more sensitive to some particles or less. If I shape it such that I get a net dp to the zero power dependence, all right, I plug that in, what I'll get is an integral that's in number concentration. That means I can put all 10 nanometer particles, I can put all 100 nanometer particles, I will get the same signal if they have got the same number of particles. It is not size dependent. That will be like your CPC, if you've used. So it will be just dependent upon uh, the number of particles, not on the size. If I make the shape diameter cube dependence, I can then get, I can then get uh, a mass or a volume uh, relation. All right, so, so how well does this work? So, so just to note, in general, if you use a diffusion charger, smaller particles are charged less efficiently than bigger particles. And the collection efficiency is almost entirely one if I just have a big plate. Um, so I would want to collect fewer bigger particles, more small particles if I want to get a signal that's insensitive to size. That means I get a number concentration. All right? To get a number concentration, I would want to collect a lot of, I, I want a big area. This area between the two blue lines is my area of the plate I would want to design. So if I have a, a plate that's very wide here, small particles, the flow is going left to right. Small particles are collected very close to the entrance and they'll be collected in a big area. As the particles uh, travel farther, you get bigger particles being collected, and I give it smaller and smaller areas for collection. For mass, I would want to collect bigger, I, because I want, I want to be sensitive to the third power and diameter, uh, I would want to, uh, you know, I want to have a bigger collector here. I, I, for co charging here, I assumed a corona charging, because if you don't have a corona charging, the area required becomes quite brutal with, uh, for you know, big particles. Uh, for corona charging, uh, you can charge big particles much more efficiently than small particles. Uh, you can get, uh, it's about a diameter to the, between one and two, so you can get nearly a diameter squared dependence, but maybe one and a half is a good estimate. I, I used only a linear one. So we could do much better than this for shape. All right, so that's all theory. theory. How well does this work? So in our, in our test so far, that's all we have done, is we've said, okay, can we create a, a collection that is independent of size? Can we just get total number, right? Not mass initially, we just want a total number. So what we have done is, so we've, we shaped the plate, that's this one right here. This shape looks a little more complicated than this blue. That's because the blue lines are calculated assuming particles are all starting from one spot and landing in one spot. And they start from a range of spots and they land in range of, range of lengths. So, so 30 nanometer particles will not just collect here, but they'll collect somewhere in this range. So that messes up calculations a little bit. The math is a little more messy, and the plate is um, a little messy. It's the central part of the plate that's, that's collecting and giving you a signal. And so then we, we should have switched the axis here. The particle collection, I, we, we, concentration, so we, we can tweak. In our experimental setup, we can put particles at different concentrations, put more or less of particles. Uh, and then we, we can measure the, the uh, electrometer signal. 
And uh, I'm, I'm showing two quantities here. The open symbols are total concentration. So if I inject these particles, the area under the curve is your open symbol. And uh, the closed symbols are just the area under the curve between in a targeted size range. So we, we said we'd collect these particles, we shaped it such that we'd get a total number in a certain size range from here to here. And the black spots are the, are the total, uh, are the, uh, uh, is, the, is the area under this curve. So what we find is, you know, here's, for example, two cases. In here, the total concentration, the area here are both the same. That's okay, it's a not, not very interesting. In here, the total area is, is you know, it's quite significant. Uh, but we're only targeting the this, this size range right in here, and our signal was actually quite <coughs> proportional to that. So the bottom line is we can shape these plates and get signals that are actually um, proportional. Uh, we've, we're, the work on mass, uh, on trying to get the diameter cube is just ongoing, so I don't have the data on that. But what I've, what I've taken is I've taken the liberty of trying to sort of put this all together, all right? So I'm towards the end of the talk here. And what I, what, what I want to... Uh, uh, show here is uh, what does this mean for measurements all right so we put all these numbers up and so on so you know does this uh, we've talked about low cost i just want to get back to what's really important which is you know what can we measure um uh, and, and with the low cost sensors and i just took an you know a, a representative optical s spectrometer i said it's uh, it can measure so many you know currents no lower than one picoamp or whatever and I said, what can it measure in terms of mass? If all the particles were of one size, let's say one micron, a typical low-cost sensor can measure about 10 microgram per meter cubed. Uh, it's a little less uh, at about 400, 500 nanometers. It can measure, actually, it's more sensitive to these particles. But uh, below, you know, below about uh, 200, 300 nanometers, it becomes, you'll need about 100 microgram per meter cubed of all particles being at 100 nanometers to be able to measure it. So it's almost never going to happen. And just remember that PM2.5, if you want to measure it, it's, the average value is about 12.5. So it's really not going to work for below 300 nanometers. If you use, a, if, if you use our, what I'm calling the tailored electrode concentration sensor for mass, um, small particles, we can detect down to 0.1 microgram per meter cube just using a diffusion charger. That's your Krypton 85, for example. Uh, and this is, you can get rid of the charger particles in the atmosphere if you just assume you have a, have a steady state charging, that's what you'll get. You can actually measure masses down to 0.1 microgram per meter cube, no problem. But above uh, 200, 300 nanometers, it gets pretty uh, insensitive. It's not going to work. If you use a corona charger, we can actually get super sensitive at small particles, but more, most, more interestingly, we can get to about one micron, the entire size range, we can measure the single instrument, we can measure mass that's sensitive. This, of course, is, is just taking some of the validations that we have provided with the number concentration, so the, the, the theory works, we just need to reshape the plate. But, but the bottom line is it's going to, it, it, for anything below what low cost measurements cannot make, we can make. And the idea here is my, my thoughts going, sorry, my thoughts going forward is that we would want to put techniques such as these. You'd want to put two techniques, optical and electrical, let's say. You put that in a single enclosure. And if they tell you the same story, all right, if they tell you the same story that this is what's happening to the particles, we're going to be able to believe it a little better because there's two different techniques. There's, the biases are going to be different. The, the uh, artifacts are going to be different. There's no reason why they, you'd, you'd have the same story from it. So they could, they could both be wrong, all right? <laughs> it, is, it is statistically possible that they both be wrong, but it is less likely than, than you know, th them both being correct I, is how I look at it. But, you know, I could be wrong statistically, yes. Um, but, but, I, but I think the other way to do it is you do use, don't use one low-cost detector, uh, do, low-cost sensor. Use two or three different ones, all right? So this whole thing about low-cost sensing is not about putting your faith in a single one. But I think if you put a faith in a combination of these, there is actually, I think, a potential for getting good quality data. Um, and, and so different techniques. And I think, I think this sort of approach might be required for gas phase sensing and so on, and, and people are doing it. It's not, not entirely our ideas here. Um, so what, what does it mean in terms of cost? Cost is different. I'm, not, I'm assuming my hourly rate is zero. My students cost nothing, which is probably okay, right? I mean, Mike. Uh, 
So, 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 so you got to watch it. This is just components here, and and what we're able to do is, you know, bring it down to below about thousand dollars because it's just the, the high voltage. We have tried ways to cut costs on it; it's not going to happen. And overall, it might work out to be two two thousand dollars. It's not getting to quite where low cost sensors are. And we've talked to a lot of people of what the idea of low cost sensors are, is. And and it's it it's, seems surprisingly that the number is somewhere between two hundred to five hundred dollars. That's what people want because you can you, you can then go for some more ubiquitous sensing. So so, uh, but what we want to focus on is the fact that we are we are actually chopping off about an order of magnitude in, in terms of cost, maybe even two orders of magnitude because we can start doing sizing in, in the order of about thousand dollars rather than hundred thousand dollars. All right, so. So that's that's sort of where uh, we're going. Uh, our, you know, the ultrafine particles are, I think, critical from a health perspective, and 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 particles in general are critical from health perspective. So there's a you know the large regions uh, of the of the globe where monitoring is not being made uh, adequately, uh, and and a lot of these places are looking at actually using low cost sensors. So they just want to put these sensors in, and our hope is we can we 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 we'll raise enough of a Concern with the single cost. I mean, these optical sensors aren't going to be able to be calibrated. All right, there's a there's a constant uh, um, uh, um, you know refrain that you know we can just calibrate it, and I'm and I'm, I'm not uh, convinced that you can ever calibrate this and and get a signal that's that's accurate all the time. What we can do is hopefully marry multiple techniques like these and see if we can get an integrated picture. And we're proposing using electrical mobility. And uh, and going forward, the thing that we are doing is we have uh, uh, we've just worked out some permissions with the New York State to put put a couple of our uh, platforms in Albany and New York City. And the idea there is we're going to be actually putting an enclosure. Think of this as like a NEMA box enclosure that's waterproof and so on. We go put in there that does all sorts of me measurements. But most importantly, it's uh, it's a very robust platform where you can plug in and out low cost sensors. So we're, it's uh, it's all. Uh, you know, all the data is all coming to a server and so on. So we're putting our sensor, other low-cost sensors, just trying to see, you know, what, what sort of measurements will come in. And, and because the low-cost sensors are coming in on a, you know, on a daily basis, you're getting new ones, we're, we're providing this to be flexible. Uh, I want to thank uh, John for uh, inviting me here uh, and Carr for, uh, for, the, for supporting the stock. Um, some of the funding and uh, students who have actually helped us uh, make these measurements, design the instruments, and so on. And I want to thank you, thank the audience for coming and sitting in late in the evening. Thank you. I guess questions. Thanks, Suresh. That was a great talk. So, any questions? We're going to use the mic because it's being recorded. Yeah. Mi microphone, not Michael. <laughs> sure, that, that is really interesting. I, the, the electric mobility is clever. I, I was curious, again, just because we do gas phase and it's it, temperature drives us crazy, the temperature confounding effects on the gas phase sensors. Do, is temperature a big problem for electric mobility as well? Um. Because you can't control, you're not controlling it, right? Right, right. The, the concern with temperature is probably less electrical mobility, more electrometer. So the electrometer, um, if you don't shield it well, you can just walk two meters away and, and affect the signal. And so it's very sensitive to temperature because the board's going to move. Uh, so yes, the temperature will be a problem, but we don't know how much of a problem. And, 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 and our hope is we can, uh, so I haven't shown you the details of the circuitry, but what we're hoping is to make uh, some redundant measurements that'll take care of baseline drifts that, that'll happen because of these issues. Um, in terms of uh, theoretical, uh, the thing it it is it, it plays a little bit of of a role in electrical mobility calculation. But I'm thinking when you say temperature, you're talking about a drift of few degrees, yeah. and, and and under those conditions, it's not a problem. Uh, I am a little worried about humidity. Uh, yeah, that was my name. yeah, yeah. So <laughs> so that that might be the, the bigger concern. Uh, we have made electrical mobility measurements in South India, and uh, you know, 90 degrees, 90 percent humidity, or 70, or 70 percent feels like 90, and it 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 does create problems sometimes. Yeah, water can build up and arc. Yeah. So that's why we want to. Yeah, we are. We'll start. Maybe Boulder would be great to start with. Yeah, it's always easier here. <laughs> Just to clean is the problem. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I know. Uh, it's, it, um, the rest of the world would say that's good, not a problem. Yeah. Any more questions? 
Hi. In your designing of the shape of the collector yeah. plates, yeah. you're um, making the assumption that, of course, we all make that all the aerosols are spherical. So um, given that not all aerosols are spherical, do you trust the number concentration measurement more or the mass? Or do you think it's going to be affected in the same way? All right. So, so shape impacts electrical mobility, right? So when we measure electrical mobility diameter, they are spherical equivalent electrical mobility diameter. Um, the impact on number is going to be less than probably on mass. And, uh, and yeah, so I think, I think the shape dependence on mass for electrical mobility, you know, within a DMA perspective, does work, right? Uh, where you're actually doing size classified measurements. When you have no size classified measurements and you have no knowledge of particles, I think my, my guess is it's going to impact mass significantly. It's going to have some impact on mass, and I think it's uh, impossible to correct. Yeah. Yeah, and th this is where it comes back to having multiple measurements because it, it's going to impact optical measurements, it's going to impact this. And it, I'm thinking, you know, again, yeah, so so let's say the numbers match well. You can say we are dealing with somewhat spherical ammonium sulfate kind of sphericity particles. When you go farther, you know you're dealing with at least some. So at least you know. Okay, ignore both the results, maybe right. So so the nice thing about having two techniques when they don't match, the best thing you can do is throw them both out, <laughs> even if one of them is correct. But you'll have so many measurements, it won't matter. It won't matter exactly, right. exactly. If there's <laughs> 1,500 in the city and they're made every second, hopefully. You lose half your data. Yeah, course. but you know how data works; they'll always be here. And <laughs> yeah. Um, I had one question. So yeah. this study in New York City, would you be receptive to other people participating if they had some sensors? To yeah, we have open to USB slots. If you can plug into USB or and you need only five to twelve volts, you can. Yeah, that's it's it's good. It's designed so the platform can accommodate sensors uh, that are. Yeah. And w what's the timeline there? Uh, September-ish is when we are slated to go in. Any more questions? Okay, well, let's thank uh, okay. Thank you.